Hello and welcome to this revision session for AQA A-Level Physics in the topic of waves, in particular progressive and stationary waves. So in today's revision session we're going to be looking at the following parts of the specification. We're going to be looking at 3.3.1.1 progressive waves, we're going to be looking at 3.3.1.2 longitudinal transverse waves and we're going to be looking at 3.3.1.3 the principle of superposition of waves and the formation of stationary waves. So let's start off by looking at progressive waves. So wave behaviour is common in both natural and man-made systems. Now waves will carry energy from one place to another and can also carry information. Now progressive waves do this without transferring matter with the energy. So a wave which will transfer energy but not transfer matter is called a progressive wave. Now we can consider waves to have the following shape. Now this is an approximation of how waves look, it is extremely simplified. Now it's important to note that you can use waves in many different real world applications such as a mobile phone or listen to the radio. Now designing comfortable and safe structures like bridges, houses, music performance halls require an understanding of mechanical waves. Whilst modern technologies such as imaging, communication systems show how we can make the most of electromagnetic waves. Now we do consider one entire wave to be when the oscillation of the structure repeats itself once. But what is the definition of a wave and what are the different types of waves? So as mentioned before, a progressive wave is a mechanism that transfers energy and or information from one place to another without the net movement of matter. So you'll notice that in this situation, energy is traveling in a particular direction, but the particles do not travel with them during this. Instead, the particles will oscillate or vibrate backwards and forwards, but throughout our wave motion, there is no net movement of the particles. So when the particles oscillate in the wave, they will transfer energy between each other, allowing energy to be transferred through the wave. So in a progressive wave, energy is transferred, but matter is not. And this is shown in a number of different examples. So for example, when a twig is dropped into a calm pool of water, ripples will form on the water surface. Now the ripples don't carry the twig or water away with them. If you strum a guitar string and create sound waves, the sound waves don't carry the air away from the guitar and create a vacuum. Likewise, when you speak, your voice box vibrates, making sound waves that travel through the air. But the air itself does not travel away from the throat, otherwise you would create a vacuum inside your throat. Now, as we mentioned before, a progressive wave will transfer this energy or information without the movement of matter overall. So instead, the wave causes the particles of your material to move backwards and forwards, as shown in this particular situation. And it could be in different orientations as well, as shown here. Now, we call this movement of backwards and forwards as an oscillation or a vibration. So it is okay to say that a wave causes particles to oscillate or vibrate. Now one complete wave or oscillation is when the particles move one way then the other and go back to where they start. So this is a cycle which shows one complete oscillation of a wave. It goes one way then it goes back to equilibrium then it goes the other way and then it finishes back at equilibrium again. Now, we say that as this wave will cause your particles to oscillate, the energy will transfer through the wave or will propagate. Now, the way in which the particles will vibrate allows you to classify the waves and what vibrates in the waves allows you to classify the wave. Now, just to clarify, a wave is a pathway for energy to move position in the universe, so it can cause energy to change store. Now, in a system, energy can change store without the need for a wave, and when this happens, this is called do work. So for example, we would say that work is done if an energy store changes type without using a wave. So we can say that we've got mechanical work. Because remember, in a system, there are four ways to change the energy store of objects. You can have work done by a force, work done by an electrical current, heating by waves, or radiation by waves. Now, it's important to also note 
that in the wave the particles will oscillate about a position but they won't move position overall. Now waves can be classified as either mechanical or electromagnetic waves and transverse or longitudinal waves. So here we've got our, our representation of a wave which is the oscillation of the energy found in the wave. Now the greater the energy in the wave the larger the oscillation and there are two different materials which can be oscillated by a wave which gives us two different types of wave or two categories of wave electromagnetic waves and mechanical waves so a mechanical wave is a wave which has oscillations of matter so atoms so a mechanical wave is caused by particles vibrating at a source and it will cause the particles to oscillate backwards and forwards but please remember there's no net displacement of the particles the particles are moving back and forth so we state overall that there's no overall movement of the particles or rather in fact they're just vibrating backwards and forwards backwards and forwards now in a sound wave the particles do not travel from the object making the sound to the object detecting the sound but the sound wave is a series of particles vibrating backwards and forwards colliding with the next particle and making that particle vibrate passing the energy on now particles oscillate or vibrate in a substance and then pass energy on uh, to the neighboring particles so that's very important to work through this is because it means that mechanical waves need particles for energy to be transferred. So mechanical waves cannot travel in a vacuum. Now, an electromagnetic wave is a wave which has oscillations, not of particles, but of electromagnetic field lines. So an electromagnetic wave is caused by, is caused by making fields oscillate at a source. So this means electromagnetic waves do not need particles to travel. They only need the electric and magnetic fields which permeate the entire universe. This means that electromagnetic waves can travel anywhere in the universe, even a vacuum. So electromagnetic waves can travel over the vacuum of space so for example they can go from the sun to the earth now electromagnetic waves in a vacuum can travel at the fastest possible speed in the universe which is three times ten to the eight meters per second nothing can travel faster than an electromagnetic wave in a vacuum now electromagnetic waves travel fastest in a vacuum as there are no particles present to slow the wave down so electromagnetic waves are oscillations of the electromagnetic field and they can travel through a vacuum. All electromagnetic waves travel at the same speed, the fastest speed in the universe in a vacuum, three times 10 to the eight meters per second, which is commonly called the speed of light. Whilst mechanical waves are oscillations of particles, they can't travel through a vacuum. Now, mechanical waves travel at different speeds depending on the material that they are traveling in. Now here we've got a diagram of a wave and we can describe the transfer of energy with lots of different terms to detail wave motion but it's very important to indicate in this diagram that the particles don't change position rather they're vibrating backwards and forwards. So the first term we can consider is amplitude which is measured in meters. So amplitude is the maximum displacement of particles from the equilibrium position which is shown here on our diagram. So the equilibrium position is the rest position of the particles or the electromagnetic field lines. The next term is the idea of wavelength and wavelength is measured in meters. So the wavelength of a wave is the length of one whole wave cycle and it can be measured as the distance between two peaks. So you could consider that the wavelength is the distance the wave travels before the wave repeats itself. Now the time period is very similar to the wavelength. Time period is measured in seconds and is the time taken for one complete wave to happen. So like wavelength, it can be measured the time it takes between two peaks. It's the distance on the actual diagram that the wave travel that, that the wave travels before it repeats itself. Now frequency, which is measured in hertz, is the number of complete oscillations in what in of a wave in one second. And this is closely linked to the time period of a wave, because frequency is equal to one over time period. So to recap, we have amplitude, we have wavelength, we have time period, and we have frequency.
We also have another term, which is the wave speed, which is this, the distance traveled by each wave every second and is measured in meters per second, but it could also be thought of as the speed in which energy is transferred by a wave. Now, just to clarify, frequency is one of the most important measurable properties of a wave, and it links to the time period of a wave and the wavelength of a wave. So remember, frequency is how many waves are produced or pass a point every single second. So what we can say is that the unit of frequency is hertz. So one hertz is one wave produced every second and 20 hertz is 20 waves passing a point every second. And like we just said, frequency in hertz is equal to one over the time period in seconds. So if you have a time period of four seconds, what would the frequency of the wave be? Well, frequency is one over time period. So therefore it's one over four in this particular question. So therefore frequency is one over four, which is 0.25 hertz. Now, in addition to quantities such as displacement, amplitude, wavelength, time period, frequency, there are several quantities that can be measured as differences between different waves. Because all progressive waves travel a certain distance, it's a measure of how much, how far the energy has been propagated. Now, the distance in dif the difference in distances between two waves okay, and how much they have travelled is called the path difference, and the path difference is measured in units of wavelength or lambda. Now you can also consider the position of a certain point along a wave cycle, and we call this the phase of the wave. Now the amount by which one wave leads or lags behind another wave is called the phase difference between the waves. Now the phase and phase difference can be measured in angles, so either degrees or radians, or you could measure it in fractions of a wave cycle. Now we can consider a progressive wave to consist of many oscillating particles if it's in fact a mechanical wave, as shown here. Now all of the particles will oscillate about a fixed position and the direction in the direction of the oscillation can be given by the position in the wave. So for example here you can see the direction which these different particles are oscillating. So you can work out the direction of oscillation by considering the movement of the wave compared to equilibrium position. So in this progressive wave, whilst the particles oscillate, the energy is being transferred. And like we mentioned before, the phase difference is how much the particle lags behind or is ahead of another particle in a wave. So particles that are in phase are oscillating with the same displacement placement and are moving in the same direction as each other. So we say they have a phase difference of zero. So two points which are one whole wavelength apart are in phase. So two points which are one wavelength apart have a, phase, have a path difference of one wavelength. So what we can say is that particles which are in phase are an integer, a whole number of wavelengths apart. So the path difference for in phase particles is n lambda, where n is any integer. So the phase difference for an in phase particle, which is now an angle, is n 2 pi radians because the 2 pi radians in one wavelength or you could say n 360 degrees because there are 360 degrees in one wavelength. Now particles that are out of phase are oscillating with different displacements or and or are oscillating different directions as each other so they will have a phase difference with each other so that's an important idea to work out so all these examples are particles which are out of phase with each other now particles that are completely out of phase are particles which oscillate with the same magnitude of displacement but are oscillating in opposite direction so we can also call this antiphase now particles that are completely out of phase or in antiphase have a phase difference of pi radians or 180 degrees because two wavelengths that are half a wavelength apart are said to be completely out of phase. So they have a path difference of half wavelengths. So the path difference for any out of phase particle is a multiple of half wavelengths. So one and a half, two and a half, three and a half, four and a half wavelengths, so on, so on, so on. Whilst the phase difference for an out of phase particles is n pi radians for odd values of n because 
even values of uh, pi radians will give in phase, whilst odd pi radian values will give out of phase. So you can see here, if we look at two particles of wavelength apart, such as C and G, we'll see that they're oscillating in the same time as each other, so they're completely in phase. But two points half a wavelength apart, such as I and K, we see they're always moving in opposite directions, so they're completely out of phase with each other. And the phase difference between the two points depends on the fraction of wavelength that lies between them. So like we said, when you have a path difference of greater than lambda or a phase difference greater than 2 pi radians, which is 360 degrees, you can express your path difference or phase difference in terms of just lambda or 2 pi radians. So for example, a phase difference of 3 pi radians between two points on a wave is also pi radians because it's one full cycle 2 pi radians plus an additional pi radians. So a phase difference of 5 pi radians between points on a wave is also pi radians because you've had two full cycles of of the wave which is four pi radians plus that pi radians whilst for example a phase difference of six pi radians between points on a wave is also zero because there has been three whole cycles of the wave six pi radians now we can also work out how fast a wave travels in a medium by carrying out this particular equation wave speed in meters per second is equal to frequency in hertz times by wavelength in meters. So this equation shows how fast a wave transfers energy throughout the universe. So the speed of a wave is the distance traveled by each wave every second in the medium. Now all waves have a finite speed because it takes time for energy to propagate from one place to another. Now in many waves, such as visible light, this time isn't perceivable to human senses, but it is present. Energy transfer is never instantaneous. So for this equation to work correctly, you've got to have a frequency of the wave in hertz and a wavelength in meters, which means you may have to convert the units given to you in a question to get to those right particular units. Now, this equation makes sense when you consider what frequency and wavelength are. Frequency is the number of waves every second, and the wavelength is the length of one wave. So if you multiply the two values together, you're getting the distance travelled by the wave in one second, which is what the wave speed is. Because we know frequency is 1 over time period, and wavelength is just distance. So wave speed is 1 over time period times by distance, so therefore wave speed is distance over time period. Now the speed of all electromagnetic waves in the universe in a vacuum is 3 times 10 to the 8 meters per second. That's the fastest possible speed in the universe. Nothing can travel faster. Now it's important to note that the speed of all electromagnetic waves in a vacuum has to be 3 times 10 to the 8 meters per second. Electromagnetic waves will alter their frequency and wavelength to give a speed of 3 times 10 to the 8 meters per second. So the higher the wavelength, the lower the frequency. The shorter the wavelength, the higher the frequency. Now, if an electromagnetic wave travels in a medium, it will change speed and slow down, as the electromagnetic wave is now hitting a substance. But the speed of an electromagnetic wave changes as the wavelength of the wave changes, because the frequency of the electromagnetic wave remains unchanged at all times after it has been produced. Now, mechanical waves can travel at different wave speeds. Mechanical waves are movements of particles, so this means that energy travels slower than for electromagnetic waves, and the mechanical wave speed depends on the mass of the particles moving and the density of the material. Now, generally, we find that mechanical waves travel faster in solids than they do in fluids. That's because the particles are closer together in a solid because the material is denser, so the vibrations are more likely to result in an energy transfer. Now again, please remember that when we talk about hertz, it's just the number of complete waves every single second. So just to clarify, electromagnetic waves all travel at the same speed. This is the fastest possible speed in the universe in a vacuum since electromagnetic waves are massless. And the speed of all electromagnetic waves in a vacuum is 3 times 10 to the 8 meters per second. Mechanical waves all travel at different speeds since this depends on particle mass and density. Now mechanical waves contain particles with mass so waves travel slower than electromagnetic waves. So here's an example question concerning wave speed. The wavelength of a wave is 45 meters. The frequency of the same wave is 20 meters. What is the speed of the wave? So you write out your equation. Wave speed is equal to frequency times by wavelength. Sub in the values, so 20 times by 45, and you get your final answer of 900 meters per second.
Now in this question, we're looking at prefixes. So the wavelength of a wave is 24 millimeters. The frequency of the same wave is 31 kilohertz. What is the wave speed of the wave? So once again, you write out your wave speed equation. Wave speed is equal to frequency times by wavelength. You then substitute in your values. Now K, killer, means times 10 to the three. So it's 31 times 10 to the three, multiplied by 24 millimeters, milli, means times 10 to the minus three. So it's times by 24 times 10 to the minus three. So we get our answer to be 740 meters per second. Let's now have a look at longitudinal and transverse waves. So as you mentioned before, a wave is a periodic disturbance in a material. Now each particle of the medium vibrates or oscillates about a fixed position and the energy is transferred outwards from the source of a wave. So waves that, the waves that move outwards from their source are called progressive waves and you've got two types, transverse and longitudinal. So the waves can oscillate in two different waves. So you get two different categories, transverse waves and longitudinal waves. So in longitudinal waves, the oscillations are in the same direction as the energy transfer. In transverse waves, the oscillations are at right angles to the energy transfer. So in transverse waves, each particle oscillates perpendicular to the direction of the propagation of the wave. So transverse waves can be modelled by moving one end of a slinky up and down with each coil representing a particle. So we've got our transverse wave here showing that we've got our oscillations of the medium perpendicular to the direction in which the wave transfers energy. Now again, in a wave, the particles don't move position, they'll only oscillate. Now all electromagnetic waves are transverse and they, they travel as vibrations through the magnetic and electrical fields with the vibrations perpendicular to the direction of energy transfer. Now other examples of transverse waves include include uh, ripples on a water wave, uh, waves on a string, in some types of earthquake seismic waves, S waves. So an example we've got here of a transverse wave is a water wave ripple. Now longitudinal waves are, are waves with oscillations which are parallel to the direction in which the wave transfers energy. Now again remember in the wave the particles don't move position, they only oscillate. So the most common example of a longitudinal wave is a sound wave. So the longitudinal waves can be modelled by moving one end of a slinky back and forth with each coil representing a particle. Now within longitudinal waves, regions in which particles are relatively close together are called compressions in regions where they're relatively far apart are called refactions and this can be shown by looking at sound waves as shown here so we can compare our two types of wave with the following um, uh, and with the following diagram as shown on screen now now transverse waves are os uh, or waves have oscillations which are perpendicular to the direction in which the waves transfer energy. So if you assume the energy propagates from left to right, the waves oscillate up and down, and all electromagnetic waves are transverse. So electromagnetic waves are transverse waves and are the only transverse waves which can travel through a vacuum. Now they all also travel at the same speed in a medium, which is three times 10 to the eight meters per second in a vacuum. So remember, electromagnetic waves are transverse waves and are produced by oscillations of the magnetic magnetic and electrical fields, so they're produced by the acceleration of move and charge. Now again, other examples of transverse waves which are not electromagnetic waves include water waves, waves on a string, and seismic waves. Longitudinal waves are waves with oscillations which are parallel to the direction in which the wave transfers energy. So if we assume the energy propagates from left to right, the waves oscillate from left to right, and examples include sound waves, p-seismic waves, and water waves as well. Now, most wave properties are shared by both transverse and longitudinal waves, but there's one that distinguishes between the two, polarization. Polarization can only happen with transverse waves. So transverse waves can be polarized, longitudinal waves cannot be polarized. So we can polarize waves with a Polaroid filter. So we can show the effect of polarization with demonstrations with Polaroid filters. But remember that polarization can only happen with transverse waves. So in 1808, Etienne Louis Mouse discovered that, wave, that light waves were polarized when they were reflected. Now at the time, light waves were thought to be longitudinal, so this couldn't be explained. However, in 1817, Thomas Young understood that light waves were transverse waves, so there were electric and magnetic fields vibrating perpendicular to propagation, so this allowed for polarization to be explained. Now in our heads, when we imagine an electromagnetic wave, we think of the following. 
However, in reality, an unpolarized wave actually has vibrations in many different planes, each two components in 90 degrees to each other. So there are many different planes of particle oscillation. Now, polarization is removing all planes of oscillation except for one plane. So a polarized wave is a wave that oscillates in one direction only. So a Polaroid or polarizing filter can be used to polarize a wave. Now, ordinary light waves are unpolarized as they're a mixture of different vibrations and directions in the wave. Now a Polaroid filter works as it removes all, plane, all planes of wave vibration except for one. So the wave coming out the other side will mean that the image will look darker as it literally removes all of the, all of the wave except for particle vibration in one plane. So we can set up two filters next to each other and investigate how this affects the wave. Now two filters which are parallel to each other will allow all of the wave to pass through so you would get a maximum intensity because after the first filter only vertical oscillations are left in this example so with the second filter the vertical oscillations can pass through so therefore they will go all the way through now if the two wet filters are perpendicular to each other they'll block all of the light because the two filters will filter out the waves in all the different planes so will completely block out the wave so in this example after the first filter only the vertical oscillations are left but at the second filter the vertical oscillations can't pass through as they'll be removed so it's show this is shown in the following example here So when it goes to 90 degrees, it's completely uh, blocked out. And you can see it here with our rotation of our two polarizing filters. So when they're parallel, maximum intensity. When they're perpendicular, zero intensity. So we can graph the intensity of the wave that passes between both filters against the difference in angles between the filters. When the filters are perpendicular to each other, the wave intensity is at a minimum. When the filters are parallel to each other, the wave intensity is at a maximum. So you can consider a Polaroid filter like a door which has a hole in a particular plane. So it only allows that plane of oscillation through the filter and no other plane. Now longitudinal waves cannot be polarised because with transverse wave there's a choice in which direction the oscillations occur. So the oscillations could be in the XZ plane, the YZ plane or anywhere in between. Now with longitudinal waves the oscillations only occur in one direction anyway parallel to the propagation so there's no need to distinguish between different oscillation directions because there's only one oscillation directions so the particles in a longitudinal wave vibrate in the same direction the wave travels in so there's no possibility to isolate a particular direction of vibration from it so polarization is just not possible in longitudinal waves so if a wave can be polarized it is proof that it must be a transverse wave now light waves that reflect off some surfaces are partially polarized so light when it's reflected off surfaces like water or glass can cause glare. Now as reflected light is partially polarized it allows us to filter some of it out using polarizing filters so if you view partially polarized light through a polarizing filter at a right angle, it can block out some of this reflected light whilst letting some of the light through which will vibrate at the angle of the filter. So what it will do is it will reduce the intensity of the light entering your eye and it is used in some sunglasses. In addition, TV signals are polarized by the orientations of the rods on the transmitting aerial because there are two types of transmitting TV aerial, the horizontally aligned aerial and the vertically aligned aerial. So to receive a strong signal, you've got to line the rods on your receiving aerial with the rods on the transmitting aerial. So if they're not aligned, the signal strength will be lower and it's the same with radio signals as well. So if you try to tune a radio signal and then move the aerial around, the signal will come and go as the transmitting and receiving aerials go in and out of alignment. Now polarization does have many uses in the real world. So it can be used in sunglasses to reduce glare, it can by reducing the partially polarized uh, light created when light is reflected by things like water and glass. Also filters can be used by photographers to alter the appearance of things like the sky and polarization can be used in the stress and strain analysis of certain plastics like perspex whilst also polarized light micrography is use a useful technique to analyze crystal structures. Let's now finally look at the principle of superposition. 
So like mentioned before, a progressive wave is a transfer of energy due to the oscillations of particles or fields. So a progressive wave will carry energy from one place to another without transferring any material. A progressive wave consists of oscillations passing through a medium or field carrying energy with it. And a progressive wave transfers energy away from a source so that the source of the wave will lose energy. But there is another type of wave, which is a stationary wave. Now a stationary or standing wave is a superposition of two progressive waves. So the two progressive waves have to be what we call coherent with each other, have the same frequency, wavelength and amplitude, and the two progressive waves must be moving in opposite directions with each other. Now unlike progressive waves, no energy is transmitted by a stationary wave, rather the energy is displayed. Now superposition happens when two or more waves pass through each other. Now because they are vectors, they will add when they overlap. Now superposition is an example of what we call interference. And interference is a property that all waves demonstrate. Now before this inter the superposition takes place, the progressive waves head towards each other. At the instant the waves cross and overlap, their displacements will combine from each wave whilst after the superposition each wave continues on its way. Now the principle of superposition is that when two or more waves overlap the resultant displacement equals the vector sum of the individual displacements of each wave. Now only coherent progressive waves can interfere. Now coherency between waves is obtained when the waves have a constant phase difference and the same frequency. So the superposition of waves can result in interference. Now when two waves meet, if their displacements are in the same direction, the displacements combine to give a bigger displacement. So for example, a crest plus a crest gives a bigger crest. A trough plus a trough gives a bigger trough. Now this is called constructive interference. Now points on waves will constructively interfere when there's a phase difference of two pi radians or any multiple of that, when the two waves are in phase. When the path difference between the waves is a multiple of the wavelength of lambda. Now, if a wave with a positive displacement meets a wave with a negative displacement, they'll cancel each other out. The displacement of the combined wave is found by adding the displacements of the two waves. So if they one's a plus and one's a minus, they'll equal out if it's the same value to be zero. Now, this is called destructive interference if they just cancel through, but if they cancel through completely to equal zero, we call it total destructive interference. Now, total destructive interference will occur when points on waves have a phase difference of pi radians or any multiple of that, they're completely out of phase. So the phase difference is that of half a wavelength or any multiple of that. Now a stationary wave can be produced on a string by setting up a driving oscillator from one end of a stretched string with the other end fixed, as shown here. Now a wave can be produced by the oscillator and sent down the string. The wave will then reflect off the fixed point and come back in the other direction and the two waves will interfere with each other and produce a stationary wave. Now the two waves will interfere with each other as they're coherent with each other and they're overlapping and they're moving in opposite directions. So the two waves interfere with each other and produce a stationary wave as shown in this particular animation. So what you can see here is you've got your stationary wave. So for most frequencies, the resultant pattern will be a jumble. However, if the oscillator happens to produce an exact number of waves in the time it takes for a wave to get to the end and back again, the two waves will reinforce each other. Now the frequencies at which this happens is called the resonant frequencies. These cause stationary waves when the overall pattern stays constant. The string just vibrates up and down making loops. Now note, by the way, you'll get the following wave pattern for transverse waves. Now the nodes are the point on the standing wave where the amplitude of vibration is zero, the particles don't move. So the particles have no energy at the nodes. Now the nodes are half a wavelength apart on a standing wave, and nodes are caused by total destructive interference between the two progressive waves. Now antinodes are points on the standing wave where the amplitude of vibration is a maximum. So the particles have maximum energy at antinodes. So the antinodes are half a wavelength apart on a standing wave. And antinodes are caused by the constructive interference between two waves. So let's now just consider 
the two different the differences between the progressive and stationary waves. So with stationary waves, the amplitude of vibration varies with position, but for progressive waves, the amplitude of vibration is the same in every position. For stationary waves, nodes and antinodes don't move along the wave, but for a progressive wave, crests and troughs do move along the wave. For stationary waves, between adjacent nodes, all the points are in a vibrating phase with each other, but for progressive waves, the phase varies continuously along the wave. And for stationary waves, waves only resonant frequencies support stationary waves, whilst all frequencies support progressive waves. So as we said before, stationary waves are not formed at all frequencies. Stationary waves only form at exact resonant frequencies. So resonant frequencies occur when an exact number of half wavelengths fit on the string, and these frequencies are called harmonics. Now the first harmonic is when the wave is vibrating at its lowest possible resonant frequency. So you'll notice from this diagram, it has a loop with a node at each end. So in this example of the first harmonic, one half wavelength fits onto the string, so the wavelength is double the length of the string. So as we say the frequency is F0, the length is lambda over 2, so therefore the wavelength is 2L. Now the second harmonic is twice the frequency of the first harmonic. There are two loops with a node in the middle and one at each end. So two half wavelengths fit on the string, so the wavelength is the length of the string, as shown here. The third harmonic is three times the frequency of the first harmonic. And you'll notice here that there are one and a half wavelengths on the string. So the frequency is three times the frequency of the first harmonic. The length of the string is three over two wavelengths, and the wavelength is therefore two over three lengths of the string. Now you can have as many harmonics as you like, but the frequency of any harmonic must be a multiple of the first harmonic's frequency. Now the properties of harmonics follow the following part pattern. For the nth harmonic, the number of nodes is n equals n is equal to n plus one. The number of antinodes is equal to n. The frequency of the nth harmonic is n times by the frequency of the first harmonic. The length is equal to n over 2 times by lambda, and the wavelength of the nth harmonic is 2L over n. So this information can be used to sketch the stationary wave pattern of the harmonic. So for the sixth harmonic, with the first harmonic having a frequency of 20 Hz, the number of nodes will be 6 plus 1, which is 7. The number of anti-nodes will equal 6. The frequency will be 6 times by 20, 120 Hz. The length will be 6 over 2 lambda, so 3 lambda, and the wavelength will be 2L over 6, which is L over 3. Now you can produce stationary waves by reflecting a microwave beam at a metal plate. The superposition of the wave and its reflection produces a stationary wave and you can find the nodes and antinodes by moving a probe between the transmitter and the reflecting plate. The probe will receive no signal at the nodes and a maximum signal at the antinodes. Now powder in a tube of air can produce stationary sound waves. A loudspeaker can produce a stationary sound wave in a tube and the powder is laid along the bottom of the tube is then shaken from the antinodes but left undisturbed at the nodes. Now a number of factors affecting resonance frequencies uh, that can be produced on a particular string. Now these include the length of the string, the mass per unit length of the string and the tension of the string. Because the longer the string, the lower the resonant frequencies because the half wavelength is longer. The more the mass per unit length of the string, the lower the resonance frequencies because the wave travel more slowly down a heavier string. And the lower the tension on the string, the lower the resonant frequency because the wave travels more slowly down a loose string. So we can express all these particular factors in this equation. F is equal to 1 over 2L times by the square root of T over mu, where F is the resonant frequency of the first harmonic in hertz, L is the length of the vibrating string in meters, T is the tension the string is under in newtons, and mu is the mass per unit length of the string in kilograms per meter. So the longer the string length, the lower the resonant frequency. The higher the mass per unit length, the lower the resonant frequency, and the larger the tension, the higher the resonant frequency. So let's summarise what we've looked at in this particular revision session. We looked at the idea of the oscillations of particles in the medium with amplitude, frequency, wavelength, speed, phase, phase difference, and frequency is one over time period. Now phase difference may be measured as angles or fractions of a cycle. Now, in addition, we know that the speed is equal to F lambda and that you can investigate the factors that determine the speed of a water wave. 
you should know the nature of longitudinal and transverse waves, including examples of each with sound, electromagnetic waves and waves on a string, and you expect to know that the direction of the displacement of particles and fields are relative to the direction of energy propagation, and that all electromagnetic waves travel at the same speed in a vacuum. You should understand polarisation is evidence for transverse waves, and applications of polarisers to include the polaroid material and the alignment of aerials for transmission and reception. We should also be aware of stationary waves, nodes and antinodes on strings, nodes, knowing the equation f is equal to 1 over 2L times by the square root of t over mu for the first harmonic, that there's a formation of stationary waves of the say of, of by two waves of the same frequency to travel in opposite directions. Um, you will also expect it to have a, understand a graphical explanation of the formation of stationary waves, that stationary waves formed on a string and those produced with microwaves and sound waves can be considered, and that sound waves, sorry, station waves on strings will be described in terms of harmonics, but we don't use the term fundamental or overtones in our descriptions. So, thank you very much for watching this particular revision session on progressive and station waves for the waves topic in AQA A-level physics. Thank you very much for watching and have a lovely day.